So, uh, to break the ice, Anthony, uh, as far as we know, you started playing D and D uh, when you were deployed uh, with your unit in Iraq in 2015, if I'm not mistaken, and now you are one of the winners of the Diana Shons Emerging Designers Award. So, what what did you see in role playing games back then that made you focus so much of Uh, on them that you yeah. got this award uh, seven years later. Yeah, no, thank you. So um, first of all, thank you all for having me here. I'm excited. And uh, yes, I, I discovered Dungeons and Dragons when I was deployed in Iraq. I was a company commander at the time and uh, I was playing with my soldiers. One of my soldiers was a dungeon master and in the desert for fun. Uh, they said, hey, well, I'll run Dungeons and Dragons for you. And I, I've always known about that as a kid but i never had people to play with so uh it was right when fifth edition came out so i jumped in and played and what i loved about it is it brings people together regardless of like in the military even regardless of rank i was playing with soldiers i was a company commander but at the table we're all equals doesn't matter what you know religion ethnicity uh, any of that you're there to play and have fun and i really connected with the idea of entering that fantasy world and expressing a kind of creative outlet at a gaming table and having fun and like doing things together as a team to accomplish objectives. And I fell in love with it. It's like, it was, you know, there's games like Skyrim and Diablo and, and Dungeons and Dragons is like better than that because the opportunities are infinite. Like you can do whatever you want. So but then I came back to the States and, uh, you know, over time I started playing more. I was a dungeon master more often found out about this place called the Dungeon Master Guild and I wanted to buy some Dwarven Forge, uh, the terrain that's really nice and, and really expensive too. So um, I told my wife, Jen, I said, hey, there's this website I can publish things on and maybe make a little money and I could use that money to fund my D&D hobby, right? So she's like, fine, sure, as long as you don't you know, waste too much money on stuff. So I got a little bit of money. I, I hired some artists, uh, hired an editor, And I wrote my first adventure and I loved it. I published it and I realized like, I can make a little money doing this. And you know, I can make cooler things and hire more artists. And it kind of just became like from, from an idea of how do I make a little bit of side money to, to buy Dwarven Forge to something I really enjoyed. And now today, uh, kind of why the Diana Jones Award was special for me is I really enjoy leading entire teams of creators from around the world, a lot from Latin America, Southeast Asia, and meeting them and giving them the opportunities to work together to build their own portfolio so they can get more recognition in the tabletop community. Because what, what I have seen is there are tabletop gamers around the world that are just want to devour content. And the problem we have is a lot of the major publishers uh, haven't invested a lot in getting translations made. So it's it's hard to break out in those, you know, regions. But if we can bring more tabletop creators into the space, freelancers from those areas, they can go back and become their own publishers or start making content that is very specific to to what they care about and the stories they want to share. And so I think we're getting to this really cool spot. And uh, so now I enjoy both. I still create. Uh, I, I still, you know, am project leads on on big projects. I'm leading some uh, really cool ones that are under NDA right now, but I'm excited to share soon. Uh, but that's it. I'm pa I'm very passionate about it, and I, I love it. Uh, Anthony, did you have any role playing experience previous to that first game in the desert, or was it that uh, your first time playing uh, a role playing game? That was my first time playing a role playing game. All right. Yeah. yeah. And it, so, <laughs> uh, I. I heard this, like, is it common for US active duty personnel to play D&D or uh, other RPGs? It's becoming a lot more popular. So, you know, you have to think about it when you go to an austere environment. So there's no, there may not be a lot of electricity. There's not, there's no Wi-Fi, you know, well, dice, a pen and a paper is all you need to like <laughs> bring this to life. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so tabletop is, yeah, it's, there's a lot of, um, military veterans and service members who who play and the, the cool thing is uh, virtual tabletops now right so we always move around a lot like i i would move around normally every 21 months i get stationed somewhere else
but virtual tabletops allow you to maintain that connection to your friends and play over long periods of time, even when you get moved uh, to a new duty station. So it's definitely picking up in popularity. Nice. That's good. That's good. Um, yeah. Do you think your military experience shaped your views on the hobby or, or how did it influence you? Yes. Um, I think the the biggest impact that that has had has been my ability to be like a project lead and work with folks to deliver a product on time, on schedule and to spec. So, you know, when you think about creatives, they they have wondrous ideas. They're so imaginative. Uh, but the, usually the hard part is like the organization side of things, the logistics of, of making something happen. Um, luckily, uh, that my military experience has helped shape me in being able to harness creative energy, uh, work with others, lift them up, and then like shepherd everyone to, to the goalpost. Um, so that, that's that been, I think, the best way is, is allowing us all to work together and then publish a book. Because at the end of the day, when you see your words edited and then translated with art, and it's, you know, very pretty and uh, people are playing your game and enjoying it, it's a really satisfying thing. And I think that military kind of like leadership experience has helped me uh, in that way. So uh, people that uh, are not familiar with uh, the military might uh, think that uh, the military is appreciated uh, or, or perhaps it even lacks empathy or it doesn't have uh, any room for expression. Or, uh, But you, on the other hand, are a... Uh, or, or uh, yes, you are an advocate for expression diversity, both in RPGs and in the military. Why is uh, this part of of life in general so important to you, Anthony? Why uh, do you put so much focus on on diversity, on expression, on uh, um, bringing new people to to the table, both in the military and uh, in RPGs? Yeah, it is a great question. Um, I think so. In the military, you know, we're at the end of the day, we're all, we we have to humanize each other first. Um, and I think that role playing games and creative outlets allow us to empathize with others that maybe we don't have cultural touchstones with, right? Uh, but by by gaming, by playing, we find those bonds that we share across any space around the world. And you realize, uh, when you when you have that understanding and empathy the way we view the world i think makes the world a better place the one thing we don't want is we don't want people in the military or in positions of power to not understand people outside of their country that's not good right like we want people to appreciate different cultures to appreciate different ways of approaching uh solving problems for example uh or coming or coming together and collaborating to solve big things like climate change or or poverty and and, and you know income inequality things like that and so i i see games as a way to teach individuals and i look at it this way uh my role in the in the military the last thing i want is ever to have to uh, see anyone go to war right that's like the worst case scenario so i am knowing what that entails i'm the biggest advocate of trying everything first to have a peaceful resolution to, to problems and i i would say from like a strategic perspective that involves getting young kids to understand empathy at an early age through the games that they interact with so that when they grow up and become leaders their worldview is shaped by those positive experiences so this is like a a really important thing to help shape just how people think at, at a larger level so that we can break down those barriers and those walls and respect each other have empathy for each other and appreciate each other and not see people as their other, they're, they're different from me, but see each other as humans and that we share a, a core bond with one another. So it's actually very important because I, I want the, the peaceful outcome uh, a, a, at all costs kind of deal. And I think gaming is a way to get there. So we, we did a little research and found uh, a, a video back from when you were a captain when you made uh, students uh, role play different scenarios to teach them about explaining their sphere of 
uh, expanding the, the, their sphere of influence, talking about emotional intelligence and leadership. So, uh, like, uh, to, to dig in a little further with, with what you were saying, what do you think of the potential of role-playing games for teaching? Like, what, uh, following what you just said, like, have you seen some some of the results? What what do you think about this, uh, like in a projection? Uh, yeah, no, I, I think, you know, that's, that's that's amazing, by the way, that you did that research. That was a, a, a oh, I'm surprised. That's the first time I've heard anyone bring that up. But it's it's good. Um, yeah, gaming, there's, there's a lot of data and evidence to show how, uh, especially adults, how we learn. So adult, you know, when you get out of high school, right, you're over 18. The way we learn is a little bit different. It tends to be more experiential. So that is actually doing things, uh, seeing things in person. And through gaming, uh, putting yourself in a position that might make you uncomfortable. For example, in Dungeons and Dragons, being uh, not a human, but a dip, you know, like a tiefling or an orc or a gnome and being maybe even you know role playing with a different gender or orientation might allow you to just put yourself in that perspective and see how the world around you interacts with you and how it sees you right so so that allows us to to understand a little bit more at a deeper level than we otherwise could because if i ask someone to imagine how it feels uh to be in someone else's shoes they can try to do that but once we start role playing and they're now here they're they're putting themselves they're hearing how people talk to them they're seeing how their actions affect the world around them and maybe someone else in the party people listen to more because they're a tall handsome human paladin and and you're a short gnome or something like that that experience and that kind of like emotional connection makes it more real than just like reading a textbook about empathy and the importance of that so uh, I, I've, I've seen it to work well. Um, you know, I know now there are a lot of different higher uh, education institutions implementing gameplay that we see with veterans uh, with post traumatic stress disorder that role playing is a way to help heal and overcome that. So D&D is actually being used to help treat veterans that suffer from PTSD. Uh, and so this is having a bigger impact, um, you know, around around the military than I think folks thought, because it's not only helping teach them valuable lessons, but it's helping uh, solve like, you know, mental health crisis uh, and, and issues that were, were there in the past. Yeah. Oh. Okay, a little bit about your contributions. You designed, produced, and or contributed to over 20 TTRPG products. How did you start your journey as a designer? So my first assignment or my first product was uh, the Air of Orcus, and I was the main designer. I was the only designer on that. I wrote it, um, and then I was able to reach out to uh, a friend of mine who lives in Argentina. He's a he's an artist, uh, Desorion, and he does like pixel art. And I was really fascinated with Nintendo back in the day, NES. And so I did all the artwork in pixel art. It looks like a Nintendo game, and uh, he made that for me. Uh, I put we put the artwork in. I worked with an editor, and then we packaged it all up. And what I found from day one was working as a team is it just enhances the product. You get uh, everyone percolating on different ideas and life experiences. Their inputs into the into the project uh, makes it more rich. So as I went through my design journey, I started off kind of like by myself with a small team and I started to incorporate, you know, graphic designers. And then my, my, one of my best friends, I met justice Alman, who is now a senior game designer at wizards of the coast. Um, we started collaborating together and being co-leads and the team grew. And if you look at my early projects, we have Laura Hurstburner, who has gone on to edit for wizards of the coast, Sadie Lowry, who's gone on to write for wizards of the coast and the teams that we made and the relationships along the way made us all mutually successful. And that's the beauty of like teamwork. Um, a lot of times folks might get jealous of other people's success or, you know, if they get credit, do I get credit? And I've noticed if you work together as a team, everyone's journey can be successful 
and you could kind of fulfill your dream of, hey, maybe writing in a Wizards of the Coast book one day, or even becoming a senior game designer at Wizards. And it all centers around the common theme of just teamwork and collaboration with others and others who are different, you know, women, men, trans, you know, LGBTQ, uh, you know, people of, of all different ethnicities. Those diverse teams help bring just a richness uh, to, to the product. So I have a, a just a tiny question before we yeah. continue. Um, regarding the, the, the recent part and the lack of empathy and, and that specific thing, I just wanted to know how, how silly are the games in the military, you know, between soldiers in the desert. Oh, they're 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 amazing. They're, they're, <laughs> you're off the wall, you're having fun, you're laughing, shenanigans. It's just like your normal, you know, uh I imagine how you play D D at your house, right? Like you're there having a good time. You know, everybody goes into uh a game of D D think they're thinking they're gonna play like Lord of the Rings, right? And it never it never turns out that way. It's always shenanigans and fun. But I think that gets to like the core of what humans are like, right? Like we we can be serious on the outside, but maybe at the end of the day, we're just kids and we want to have fun with each other. And like, this helps bring that out, you know, and that laughter and that joy um, and that silliness. So yeah, it, it's always a good time. Let's go back, let's go back a, a little bit to uh, your first uh, adventure, Air of, uh, of Orcus. Yeah. Uh, this adventure is, um, very neat in its uh, design. It has uh, flowcharts. Uh, it details the order of the scenes, uh, mm -hmm. how they should be played, and it also talks about how to play the the three pillars of D and D, mm -hmm. and they each have their little section. It's really well organized. <laughs> so I I have to infer now that this is a product of, of your military education. Do you think that this um, way of communicating a D&D &D adventure in this case is a, a product of, of the way you were um, fought uh, there in, in the military? Yes, uh, it's a little bit of both. So I've been lucky where the my journey in the military has been very unique. Um, and most people don't know this, but the military will offer a lot of educational opportunities. Uh, and you'll see this in that video you mentioned where I was teaching students. So um, after I did my company command time and I led my unit and I was in Iraq and stuff playing D&D, the army sent me to get a graduate degree, a master's in higher education. And so that's why I ended up teaching students at the university. I was an ROTC instructor. But the tools that that, that gave me were the understanding of how adults learn and and how do you convey information to an adult audience in a way they can digest information and, and synthesize it and retain it. So a lot of my products, I'm using a very specific means of, uh, of adult learning, kind of certain methods, educational methods to kind of build my products in a way that allow people who are reading them to, to understand the organization and structure and then best retain that and then, you know, run run the module uh for their own table so it's it uh that's kind of where it comes from yeah wow <laughs> so uh you've been involved in several projects that aim to create more opportunities for people of color in the ttrpg industry how did this start yeah this is good um, i think one of the best ones i'll point to is um uh, beyond the Radiant Citadel, uh, you know, journeys beyond the Radiant Citadel. Yeah. So uh, Ajit George, who led the Radiant Citadel project with a lot of the creators on there, uh, you know, I, I have been able to become friends with him. And uh, through that, he does a lot of charity work, does a lot of focused development on uplifting POCs in the creator community. And having myself done a lot of projects with the Dungeon Masters Guild, I thought, well, this would be a great time to reach out to some of the writers on Radiant Citadel to expand upon the worlds they built, but also reach out to POC uh, artists, you know, uh, and and ask them to create artwork for, for this project that I'm doing. So we had about 22 uh, artists that were commissioned for that. And I worked with one bookshelf and through the DM skill, I kind of pitched them this idea and they helped fund that artwork. So it was really great. So they funded it and the uh, kind of the idea was the artwork would be made free to all creators to use. Uh, there is also an opportunity now for you to 
pay what you want for that art pack and even put a small donation in there. And those artists still get royalties from that. So the deal was we wanted them to get paid upfront a flat fee that was very fair wage, right, for their artwork. They got paid very well for that. But they also now have a lifetime royalty on that art pack. And the art pack is also an optionally, it's free to creators. Again, the biggest part about publishing a product is it's hard to get artwork and, and graphic assets. And so when, we, when I did that project, I wanted to work with uh, POCs from around the world that were artists to create that, work with the creators from Radiant Citadel to expand upon their worlds, and then give back to the community by saying, here are these free graphic assets and these free art pieces that you can use to tell your own stories inspired by the Radiant Citadel or other worlds in, in the Forgotten Realms or Eberron. Um, but that way, if you don't have a lot of money, uh, you know, because you're you're not in, in a place where you don't have the job to afford it or, you know, you're just in an area where that's your timing is not right. You can get these free resources and still make a, a beautiful project and put it out there and people can help notice you by the cover that is the graphic design with the artwork and that's kind of the idea behind that. So uh, I've done that and I continue to do other projects and and work with a great cast of creators. And what I like to do is uh, identify creators early on that ha that are showing a lot of talent and promise and I'll help mentor them uh, and work with them so that they can sharpen those skills and then find themselves getting freelance assignments at bigger publishers. And that help, that's mutually beneficial to that creator and also to the publisher because now they got a good freelancer that, that can make content for them. So, oh, that's amazing. Go, go, go. Uh, what do you think the industry in general or the community, the role-playing community, uh, can do better to be more diverse, more inclusive, of people of color, of people from other countries that are not the United States, what what is still to be done? I think what needs to be done is um, that's a good that's a good question. I think about this a lot. Um, there, there's stuff we're doing with uh, Big Bad Con. I don't know if you've heard of it, but Big Bad Con we have a POC programming track, and we we try to raise money to fly creators from across the world out like Latin America, Southeast Asia specifically. We have a few from the UK um, that we fly out to San Francisco and we look at their portfolio, what they want to do, whether that's game design, editing, streaming, and we pair them up with industry professionals that are actively hiring or mentoring for those positions. Um, so I would love to see more of that. Like at, we, we started that or Ajit George started that at, in 2019. And I've been working with him since this is the third year we'll be doing that event. Um, but I would love to see that replicated because part of the issue is it's hard to network with the publishers that are located here in the United States if you don't live here, right? It's also hard to get here because it costs thousands of dollars. So it's hard to say, you know, hey, uh, you know, someone who's living in Latin America, you, you got to just fly to a convention in the United States. Well, that could be a month or two of, of salary that it costs just to get there uh, on the hope of you might get hired. So I would I would like to see publishers helping continue to fund events like the ones we're doing, but also conventions around the United States offer more opportunities for those POC creators outside of the United States to kind of fly in and help network so that publishers can can work with them And, and they can get those assignments and continue to flourish and, and thrive. Because it's like a chicken or egg scenario, right? Like you need someone who can make a book, a, an RPG book to get experience. Well, how do they get experience? They gotta do it themselves or they can work with a, with a publisher, right? So we want them to, while they can work by themselves and self-publish, we want them to work with publishers to see how it's done from an industry perspective. And then take that experience back to their own country and replicate it. Because then they could start having their own publishers within their own country that that rise up and start to hire within their own local economy, freelancers, editors, artists. And that's how you kind of like get this network uh, of creators that kind of makes a spider web across the world. And then it, the, the, the hobby will just kind of grow organically that way. That's amazing. So in the in Gen Con, like we you just mentioned that uh, you are one of the winners 
of the Diana Jones Award. Yes. Uh, so the question is here: is this how this did this happen? <laughs> how uh, what what were you doing when you found out about this? Is yeah, uh, I, I was. Uh, I, I was uh, I was nominated for that award, and there is a uh, a board that the Diana Jones Award has. A, a you know their board members they nominated I believe eight uh, finalists, and then they selected four. Um, and so when I found out what, what I was what I was doing, I was working on some projects, and uh, when I found out, it was it was very nice and uh, humbling to to see that because um, it, it, you know I got the opportunity to go to Gen Con for the first time ever because of that um and i know it kind of goes back to my previous statement of things like that programs like that that will help you go somewhere and then meet people that you've never met or continue to you know be rec get recognition and then individuals will you know give you opportunities uh that's what it's all about and i think that the diana jones award their emerging designer program does that they flew in you know a few people from around the world as well and they'll continue to do that and it's great like uh you know sen was with us and it was her first time in the united states ever and 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 at gen con on top of that so you know it's really cool uh that they did that and um i was very appreciative and i hope they continue uh that program so others get opportunities as well and and the recognition they deserve because they're all amazing talented designers so uh there was uh, some criticism in Twitter about uh, your award. Uh, yes. Yeah, we'll <laughs> just talk about that. Let's talk about it. Uh, uh, we always talk about the the way uh, TTRPGs connect us and, and the power they have to heal this this one. So we have a question. It is perhaps n not a, a an easy question, right? But but I think it, it needs to be done and, and we'd love to, to hear your, your thoughts about it. Uh, what would you like to to communicate to, to tell to people like like us for example that we are from the global south that uh, we were raised in countries that at one point in the past uh, of course uh, we had for example mil military dictatorships uh, that were backed by the united states uh, long ago right i mean yeah. at some uh, point in history some colleague of yours decided that was <laughs> The best for our country and some people i mean we are talking to you we 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 love what we are hearing we we saw your work but some people from the global south may be uh, skeptic about a uh, a united states military officer in active duty talking about inclusion or that and and i, I believe it's fair to hear your your point right yeah. uh, what what would you say about that yeah, and I have to disclaimer this uh, for legal purposes, but what I'm about to say is my personal opinion, uh, not the, the opinion of the Department of Defense, okay? Um, what do I think about, look, this is a very, to, be, to speak bluntly, um, you, you bring up a very valid uh, point, a very essential point, and I would say this, sir, for, these things come down to individual choices, um, and I'll speak for myself, um, but I, re I realize, uh, I I've studied political science history. Um, I saw the war on terror firsthand. I saw how that turned out. Uh, the 20 years of war we had in the Middle East. And I believe it is incumbent upon individuals, uh, myself, that I, I have to try to be a voice that people hear. Um, otherwise, I cede room to those who don't see the world the same way I do or who who will continue to make mistakes that were made in the past. And that's the most realistic thing I, I can say. It, it, it's not that if I didn't serve, the army would go away. It is if I didn't serve, the army would be deprived of someone like me who can help make decisions or help introduce ideas that are beneficial. For example, you saw me talking to those students. So uh, that is me helping shape the next generation of leaders and if it wasn't me it could be someone else and maybe they don't share the same kind of you know values that america is supposed to have and talk about and and, and believe in and so it, that's why i find it's important like you know these things are, are are vital because at the end of the day the the, the things you bring up 
Uh, when you get right down to it, people have died uh, for those mistakes. People have paid grave consequences. People have been thrown in jail. Families ruined. Um, I, you know, could I sit in America and have another job and kind of clean my hands of that? Sure. Uh, what I'm not doing though is is saying that there's nothing that was wrong ever done. I'm saying we have to be better for for your children, for my children, for the next generation. We have to do everything we can so that the mistakes of the past are not repeated. And it and it really is something that I um, grapple with because uh, again, having led soldiers in, in a combat zone, uh, having seen. The, the folks, you know, over there and what they have to deal with in the aftermath. Uh, it's real. It's real. And it should piss some people off that that was allowed to happen. And and it should make us want to uh, do things to help make sure that never happens again. Um, and that and that's some that's kind of like some some uh, real things that are heavy uh, to talk about, but they're important. And it's a viewpoint that I think, you know, those who want to see change, there's institutions that exist where change occurs, maybe slowly, maybe not as fast as people want. But um, I would rather have folks in the room who believe like I do than to not have folks in the room that believe that way. So, you know, that, I hope that kind of answers some of, of the question for you. It answers a lot. Uh, and I uh, want to thank you for answering that question because it's really important. I mean, uh, uh, one of the things we are talking about here is uh, the power of RPGs to bring people together, right? And and that's precisely what we are doing. We wouldn't be having this conversation, right? Uh, yeah. Three Argentinian citizens and an officer of the US military are yeah. talking because of, of the Andy right now. I mean, <laughs> yeah. how, how crazy. <laughs> so yeah. um, I think uh, Leon, you had a, a, a question about uh, precisely this uh, healing and, and and veterans. Not so. So I asked you before about how silly the games are in the military, and and it, it is really nice that it's really nice that they are as silly as any other game out there. Uh, but you also mentioned that it's used to help veterans to heal, and and I was wondering. What does uh, the DRPGs provide them to heal? Because you 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 can simulate any scenario in in any in a story in a table, and, and I know it's it's very safe, but I don't know. Maybe it might be triggering for them, or or, or, or something like that. So, how does the the D and D help you through that? Yeah, this is you know. So these tools and that kind of um, treatment would be handled by a medical professional. So there's a lot of therapists, uh, uh, licensed therapists, licensed psychologists, who will use that uh, form of play or experiential learning to help uh, those suffering from PTSD or other traumas, uh, traumatic events or fears or phobias to, to kind of heal the underlying issue, right? And what I mean heal is to confront things, to to uh, address things, to be in a safe environment where they can maybe relive some things as well. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't be able to give the exact specifics since I'm not licensed in that that form. But um, being able to, you know, be be in a safe environment with a licensed professional to confront uh, and experience certain situations that will help you, just you know. That traumatic event might might allow you to kind of overcome something uh, that you weren't able to in the past. So, yeah, uh, it's a it's a sensitive thing in the sense of uh, how you execute it, right? How you how you do that. Um, but there's a lot of like academic evidence now coming out about the power of that uh, with children, with veterans, with you know just people in general uh, who experience those issues um, and and the benefits it has. So it's a uh, It's something if you if you ever need that, if you think you might need something like that, I would recommend that folks who listen, uh, you know, look up online. Maybe there's uh, resources for them to reach out and do that. But it's it's definitely something that I think is a very good positive thing for the community. It is. It is. Yes. So um, changing a little bit the subject. 
what advice would you give to an aspiring game designer, especially someone that identifies as a person of color or that is not a US citizen? Like, what are the actionable steps someone could take, should take, okay. according to your experience? Yeah. I would say actionable steps. So there is a great uh, website, the Storytelling Collective. It's run by Ashley Warren. And uh, they run a workshop, write your first adventure uh, workshop. And they, they have some ed workshops where you learn how to write encounters. And when you take that course, it will end with you publishing it on the Dungeon Masters Guild. They'll give you some free assets and resources. Uh, you know, there's the classes that talk. There's like the little modules that you take at your own pace that each day uh, tell you what to do, you know, how to write the introduction, how to write an encounter, how to draw a map and, and do all those sorts of things. Um, and they do have like scholarships. So if you're in a position where you're not financially able to do that, I think it's about uh, 30, 40 US dollars. They will uh, take scholarship, scholar applicants who, who have a financial need and they'll waive the fee and you can take it for free. So that is the first step is to take to check out that. Um, there's also some free tools on the Dungeon Masters Guild and on Drive Through RPG that writers can look at that are uh, templates. Uh, you know, there are some writing templates. There's also some style guides. And just if you want to create, you almost have to look at uh, creating as a as a writing a technical manual that Dungeon Masters are going to use. It's a little bit different because initially some people might think. Um, this is easy you know i'm gonna do like i do when i run my own game at home i'm gonna write notes and bullet points or i'm gonna write a novel and it's gonna be a big epic story the difference is when you write for an audience when you write to make a product it's supposed to appeal to all different types of dungeon masters that are not trying to necessarily necessarily tell your story they're trying to tell their table story so kind of going in with that approach of uh understanding that and also i think uh MT Black has written a good uh, product on the drive through RPG that talks about creating an adventure. Uh, so you could look up MT Black and find him on the drive through RPG. He's also very prolific on uh, Dungeon Master Skill, but he has some, I, I think it's called The Anatomy of Adventure is what it's called. That's a book you can get uh, relatively affordable and um, pick it up and it teaches you how to make adventures. And so those things are, are very good as well. So, Anthony, what what can we expect from Anthony Jose Rivera in the following months? We know you are working, you have uh, an NDA on <laughs> something related to a big intellectual property, and you can yeah. talk about it. But what what can we expect from from you in in the coming weeks? Yeah. Now? So okay, so I'll give you some few things, right? So um, since January. Of this year, I've been working on that big project. Um, I can tell you that it is um, a new system uh, backed by a very big intellectual property. So it's going to be very exciting uh, when when that whole project, well, the project has been announced, the team hasn't. So there's the riddle. Um, but, but I've been fortunate to be the project lead on that and overseeing the development of it. And it's coming along extremely well. Um, and, and I think you'll, you'll all enjoy that, but that's kind of what I've been doing. That project will take me, uh, into next year. Um, but the stuff I don't have NDA right now is, uh, Candela Obscura was announced by, uh, Critical Role. So I have, uh, I was a consultant on that. And then I also have done some writing on that. So there will be a lot of cool stuff that I wrote that's in the books that are coming out, uh, here in the near future from, from Critical Role. So that's exciting. And then, um, Uh, there's another really cool opportunity that I have to write an adventure for something uh, that will be in the future, but that that's a, it's a, a bucket item list that I've wanted to do for some time and that will finally uh, come to fruition. So, so we'll see. So yeah, I'm, I'm working on things and, and then on the side, I do stuff with Big Bad Con, my, you know, mentoring and reaching out to different creators and working with them. So it's been good. Yeah. I'm excited to show you what happens. Well, thank you for being here, Anthony. It was a great interview, and it has it had some hard questions, but I, I believe they are. They, it's good to to ask them and and to hear your your Absolutely. what do you have to say about it. I learned a lot in this interview, and and 
uh, like we always say, uh, I'm going to steal this phrase from Leon, uh, it was a treat to have you here. So thank you. Thank you very much. Likewise. And again, thank you for, for having me. And um, thank you for asking those those questions. Like um, they're, they were, they're questions that deserve answers and are worth asking. And so I'm glad to have been at this table with you all and uh, partake in this conversation. So thank you.